Hello again, friends. My name is Swami, otherwise known as Bruce P. Grether. And I'm Nimbus. Otherwise known as... Nimbus. Hey, you. He is. Oh, but anyway, uh, we're going to continue talking about uh, the nine realities one by one a little bit, but um, <clears throat> this time uh, we're going to start uh, talking a little bit about reality number four, <coughs> which is I am virtually identical with every human being. So if you want to read the, the first three paragraphs of that, maybe that gives a general idea of what, what our subject is. Thank you, Nimbus. Oh, you're welcome, Swami. <laughs> okay. You have such a you're ready, kids. Smile. Here it's it like is. You're ready, kids. Here it is. Humanity dog. has never before faced such an, ama an amazing opportunity to evolve rapidly. And this is a collective evolutionary impulse for the entire species. We have created a planetary crisis. So often we operate from the powerful and mysterious unconscious realm. We can and must consciously witness this global situation that requires us to mature as a species from our collective childhood into our species adolescence. As our childhood ends, we are in this process of awakening. I want to mention a, a wonderful book by my friend uh, Toby Johnson, who is actually among the people that I thanked on the copyright page of, of, of my book. And this he is, is he's brilliant. He is very brilliant, and he's a wonderful man, and he's a great, great uh, scholar and human being of, of rare quality. Uh, this book is called Finding Your Own True Myth, What I Learned from Joseph Campbell, and it is an updated, completely revised uh, third version of a book he wrote called The Myth of the Great Secret, and this is a phenomenal book that I am still in the process of reading. I hope I wasn't blocking the microphone. I'm still reading this book. One of the things I've noticed about uh, this is that both Toby and I are big fans of Arthur C. Clarke's uh, incredible science fiction novel from way back called Childhood's End. And this is one of the reasons I talk about the, the end of our childhood as a species, because I think we are entering our adolescence, which adolescence, of course, is a major transformational stage, right? Between, well, it's also very turbulent. It is turbulent, but it's between childhood and adulthood. And by adulthood, I really mean maturity. An adult, by definition, is an organism that stopped growing. We don't want that. But maturity is, is in my view, maturity is actually reclaiming your inner child, but no longer being childish in a negative uh, sense of you know being a brat. So well, anyway, you have the floor. Nimbus, what do you think about oh, I can, Thank you. I can think of about 500 different things to say, just about all that what you just said. Of course, that's my problem. I can think of 500 things to say. But, um, you know, getting back to your child, I don't mm -hmm. like to quote mm -hmm. scriptures, but here it is. The kingdom you. of God is within you. Whoever does not accept the kingdom like a little child will never enter it. There, I said. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Now, um, the point, mm -hmm. the thing is, um, it is our adolescence, and um, adolescence, but we, I, I think we're like uh, a prepubescent or pubescent child who has discovered a room full of guns and uh -oh. uh, you know i mean we are devastating the earth but maybe that's meant to be maybe it looks i'm not saying it's okay or that you know we shouldn't change our attitudes and all that but um 
they, they we're now calling this time we live in the Anthropocene era. You can right. look up right. geologic right. eras, kids, sure. And, sure. Uh, see what the, and this is the one mm -hmm. because yeah. humans yeah. have become able to alter the environment. There yeah. are so yeah. many of us, That's right. and we have so much power, which is also a great danger. I wonder if it's not a test to mm -hmm. see mm -hmm. if we'll pass or fail. That's one way to look at it. Sure. But another sure. way to look at it is um, that, you know, all this could be something that's meant to be. Mm -hmm. When the, what was it called? The Devonian extinction, for example. That, and there was another one. I, 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 I'm not sure of the names. The Cambrian, the Cambrian, the Cambrian extinction. was a pretty major one, I think. That was a big yeah. one because life had right. developed more by then it was more mm -hmm. complex and there were mm -hmm. all these things living in the ocean trinal bites and stuff which are and they were just wiped out yeah like you took iodine or alcohol and put them on there and they were just killed and but yeah. you know sure here we are here we are right. again and then i'll be quiet once i tell this short little story okay there is an organism that i recently read about uh -huh. And it's called, I forget the technical name, but they're called moss pigs. And they live, they're <laughs> very, they're microscopic, but uh -huh. not, they're big for being microscopic. And it's like a little organism and it has eight legs and claws and, and it, it lives on lichens and eats bacteria. Mm -hmm. They can survive heat like 200 degrees that's Fahrenheit. a water bear also they call it right water bear bingo yes now kids look up water bears what i forget the name does it really cool other long name yeah, and it's not a it? scientific a, name i yeah. forget but anyways um but i had the thought these little creatures might be an evolutionary fail safe mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so that if everything yeah. that had more than you know three cells or whatever was destroyed mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they would survive and repopulate and, and if they continued and they had the niches or whatever they might right. begin niches itches um itchy niches Right, that I have a few of those. I won't show them to you. Um, that they could start another um, mm -hmm. process of evolution. Right. I have spoken. You have the floor. Thank you for listening. No, I always feel like I'm talking too much, but whatever. Yeah. No, thank you for you know, and and I think that that's a very fascinating possibility. Is that that if if we uh, if we destroy ourselves and part of the ecosystem, it is likely to re-evolve, and there there could be another uh, major species would arise that was sentient and what we would consider civilized in some ways. But um, I and think maybe do a better job. Well, I don't. But, I don't. But, I don't. I'm not. I'm not pessimistic. No, and I, and I think that's a possibility, but I don't think there's any reason to believe it's necessarily what will happen either. No, absolutely the, the not. The fourth reality, as I am virtually identical with every human being, is about the, the, the collective human uh, hive. It's the, it's the, the centralized, in, in, in history, it's the, the urban density that we have created by centralizing and building cities and and we centralize resources we sent now we centralize information we centralize population and it it reaches a certain density and then it seems like it kind of starts to fracture and it sends out uh new new uh seed ships or or pioneers or or colonists to just like a living create, organism yeah to create a, a new uh a whole new group of, of uh, 
and it's actually seems to be an evolutionary process. Yeah, you can see that in history, and you can see yes. it in biology. As you say, it's like an evolutionary thing. And the the interesting thing about the about the fact that we are so close to identical with other human beings is this is a genetic reality. You know, we're what ninety eight point six percent identical with chimpanzees. So the bonobos. Don't get me started about bonobos. bonobos. Well, we can oh, talk about. I bonobos. love bonobos. And, and we should so, all be more like them, especially yes. men. Anyway. Absolutely. In fact, you know. Uh, uh, but think about the fact that compared to any other human being, no matter how different you think they look from you or what their mm -hmm. gender is or anything, we're 99.9 .9 whatever. Uh, we're very close to identical genetically. Um, yep. yep. And, and the, the things that make us... And this is science. Different. We're not yeah. making this up, kids. That's right. But the yep. things that make us appear different and seem different as personalities and all that stuff that has some genetic basis is very, very superficial compared to how close to identical we are. You know, mm -hmm. uh, the, not the only to bonobos, but to everything that's alive. Right. And in fact, in fact, I talk in this reality about bonobos and chimps. And, you know, bonobos and chimpanzees were at one point all considered to be chimpanzees. And chimps... Uh, what are now called chimpanzees are quite a bit more aggressive than bonobos. They're they're amazing creatures, but they are sometimes very violent and territorial, and they kill each other as well as killing a lot of other creatures. Just the, like humans. <clears throat> just like very much like humans, but bonobos resemble humans in a lot of ways too. Only as you know, the bonobos they're not vegetarians, but they are much more peaceable because they'd rather have sex. They're their conflict Angular. resolution is through sharing erotic pleasure, and they're considered very promiscuous and highly sexed, which they are. Instead of fighting, they have sex. They, yeah, instead of fighting, we'll be polite about our terminology. We won't use an F word that is improper. No, I didn't, no, I didn't say that. I know you didn't. Thank you. Okay. But instead sex, of fighting, they have, have sex. sex to me, sex, sex is, I use the, the word F sex words. to mean biological reproductive functions. I would say they are highly erotic eroticized because they they obviously they enjoy their pleasure uh in a way that parallels the way we do to some extent because they use it they use it for social bonding yes and they're designed like as we are uh their females don't have just one periodic season of of uh, sexual availability once a year or whatever like a lot of other mammals <coughs> They they can have sex virtually any time, and they can also have sex face to face. This is really significant because, in some ways, the bonobos are much more like us than the, than the chimpanzees, and they're our closest genetic relative. So, kids, we look would, up bonobos and study them and yeah, learn how to yeah. become more like them. Yeah, and in fact, uh, the bonobos are exactly we. I think we are we serve our own interests and the interests of the whole planet by tr emulating them more. I and think the Bonobos the stayed, they stayed in the garden. Yes. Whereas our ancestors left the garden. Well, right. And in now we need to get back to the garden. And one way would yes. be to study their way. I'm not saying, I'm not holding them up as, you know, an answer to everything. But anyway, just to make that point, and that, that's yeah, that. exactly. And I think we can finish this time kind of with this last line of, of uh, the section about uh, reality number four. We are all far more alike than we are different. Yeah. I think the important thing about getting back to the garden is it's not actually a step backwards. It's a step forward into our original innocence, which this is all in our mind. The fact that we left the garden is really a state of mind. You know, it's a way. Right. Of, it's right. a way of relating to to our life. Right. So we got confused. Yes. A lot of fun. Peace and what? Peace, love, and justice. That's right. And and sometimes some really nice dark chocolate. Yes, and also what Bonobos do when they're. Exactly. Okay, that's it. Yeah, bye. Tickle <laughs> each other and have a lot of fun, right? Ah, <laughs> bye yeah. Bye. <laughs> bye, kids. <laughs>